Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nirav Shah, the Director of Maine's Center for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm delighted to be able to join everyone this afternoon to provide you an update on where we are with respect to COVID-19 for the entire state of Maine for today, Tuesday, March 16th, 2021. Overall, across the state, we now have a total of 47,388 cases of COVID-19, representing an increase of 189 cases since yesterday. Of those, 36,726 are confirmed and 10,662 are probable cases. Since we began work on the pandemic, 1,605 people have been hospitalized. <clears throat> and just in the past 30 days alone, 93 people have been hospitalized. Right now in the state, 86 people are in the hospital. 26 of them are in a critical care unit and eight are on a ventilator. Overall, 725 people have died with COVID since we recorded our first case just over a year ago. And of our cases, 4,318 are among healthcare workers. Turning now to some numbers and metrics with respect to where we are on testing. Our positivity rate for PCR tests over the past seven days now stands at 1.55%, with a testing volume of 612 PCR tests for every 100,000 people in Maine. Our antigen testing rate is at 5.14% on a seven-day basis, and there are about 132 antigen tests that are being conducted for every 100,000 people in the state right now. There's one other milestone that I wanted to note today. Our Public Health Emergency Preparedness Program yesterday delivered its five millionth piece of PPE, five million pieces delivered since we first began delivering PPE, which itself began weeks before our first case. I'd just like to take a second to recognize the Maine CDC's Public Health Emergency Preparedness Team for their efforts over the past year. They, do, they have delivered without fail, again, 5 million pieces of PPE to healthcare providers, hospitals, long-term care facilities, EMS agencies, and a number of other groups. The people that are receiving this PPE are your friends and neighbors, folks who work in healthcare and other settings on the front line. And I'd just like to take a moment to thank and recognize the Maine CDC's Public Health Emergency Preparedness Team. They're not doing it alone, though. They have, for many, many months now, received constant and strong support from a detachment of members of the National Guard who have been working hand, by, hand in hand with them throughout this process. I'd also like to take a moment to thank those members of the Guard who have been deployed to assist in this PPE effort. Turning next to vaccines. And unfortunately, I don't have vaccine or vaccination numbers for you today. The system that we and a number of other states use to track the administration of dosages had an outage yesterday evening. So the first time the system has gone offline in six years. Uh, Maine is not the only state that was affected by this outage in our system, a system that's called Impact. And the company that stands it up is working feverishly to get the system back online. But I want to just make some important notes about this outage. <clears throat> Number one, vaccinations are not affected by this. People in Maine were being vaccinated yesterday and they're being vaccinated today. The only thing that is affected by this is just our tracking, our data management of those. Number two, new orders of vaccine are not affected by this outage. We will hopefully in the next couple of days receive an estimate of what our order, our volume of vaccines will be for next week. And we will be able to place those orders we hopefully will have this outage resolved long before that, but anything regarding ordering of new vaccines is not affected by this. And third, distribution of vaccines across the state is not affected by this. Vaccines are being distributed by the shipper this yesterday and today, and that process is unaffected 
by this temporary outage in our database. We hope to have it up online as soon as possible. Again, we know that the company that manages that database for Maine and a number of states is working very hard, as you can imagine, the importance of having those numbers right now. Once we get all that updated, we'll be back online, our dashboard will be back online, and we'll have the latest numbers for you. <clears throat> I'd also like to take a second to just talk a little bit about where the virus is, not just in Maine, but situate that against the broader context. Let's first talk about Maine <clears throat> and think about where we were in Maine with respect to COVID just one incubation period, 14 days ago. One incubation period ago, there were 69 people in the hospital. Today, with COVID, today that number stands at 86, an increase of 17 people just in one incubation period. Two weeks ago, the positivity rate in Maine was 1.35% for PCR tests. Today, it's at 1.55%. Again, a notable increase. This comes as we are seeing cases rise significantly in other parts of the world. Western Europe, which is reimposing closers. South America, other parts of the world are starting to see an uptick in their numbers of cases. And indeed, in other parts of the United States, the significant decline in cases that we saw over the past six or seven weeks has started to stall out. All of this is a reminder that we're not out of this. COVID-19 is still very much with us, even though we are making notable progress with respect to vaccines and vaccination efforts. The virus is still not done with us. We still have a ways to go. All of that, is reason to make sure that you are adhering to things like best practices around masking and social distancing. Here in Maine, we too have noted some areas of concern. Piscataquis County in particular is an area that we are focused on. Just over the past 16 days, since March 1st, there have been a total of 76, uh, 76 cases of COVID-19 in Piscataquis County. Now, to put that number in perspective, for that same period, February 1st through February 16th, one month ago, there were only 36 cases in, Pisca in Piscataquis County. But from March 1st through March 16th, we've logged 76 cases, just a little over double the number of cases this far into March as compared to where we were this far into February. The average range of those cases in Piscataquis County is 43, but the range is significant. The, the range of those cases goes from individuals as young as nine all the way up to 85. There's been one hospitalization, and thankfully there have not been any deaths, but these cases have affected, for example, three healthcare workers in Piscataquis County. There have also been no confirmed outbreaks. So what we are seeing is a significant uptick in community transmission. We've identified some known clusters and are trying to figure out whether there are epidemiological links between and among those clusters. We've also seen a number of restaurants being named in the exposures as we've talked to folks to do our case investigation to try to determine where they may have been exposed. All of this is to say, as I mentioned a moment ago, we are not out of this yet as a state, as well as, as at the county level. So no matter where you are in Maine, this is a good reminder that even though vaccines are with us and we are making progress, the tried and true public health tools that got us this far as a state, masking, social distancing, avoiding crowds, as well as the basic hygiene tips that we've talked about are still best practices. They haven't gone away, even though we're making progress on vaccines. And in particular, if you happen to be in Piscataquis County or work there or travel to there, take extra precautions there as well. We are conducting our investigations to try to get a better sense of what might be going on there and what we might be able to do to equip folks to get a better handle on things. But I wanted to take this moment to just reflect on where we are as a globe, as a country, and even here in our state. We're seeing cases start to increase and we'd like to make sure that everybody knows about it so they can take steps to stay safe. And finally, 
one note that we talked about last week with Commissioner Lambrew, but that I wanted to emphasize really, really strongly. And that is our community vaccine line. The number for that line is 888-445-4111. And again, this is a telephone line, a hotline, where anyone can call if they are having trouble finding an appointment for vaccines because they are having difficulty accessing the various websites or scheduling online. This is not a general number, and it's not, an, it's not a venue through which you can get a faster appointment. It's not an express lane. It is a way, however, for Mainers for whom making an appointment online may not be available to them. It may be difficult for them to navigate the websites. Broadband access may be a challenge. Or, for example, they may need interpretation services. If you fall into one of those categories, this hotline, this, uh, this line is available for you. And again, that number is 1-888-445-4111. If you are in one of those groups that's having trouble scheduling, please don't hesitate to call. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to our colleagues in the media. The first question for the afternoon goes to Patty White. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. I'm wondering if you can tell us anything more that you know about the cases in Piscataquis County or anywhere. I mean, I know you said they're under investigation, but um, you know, this winter it was small group gatherings that were causing cases. Are you seeing the same kinds of things or what else can you tell us about how this is spreading? Yep, thanks for that question, Patty. We've, you know, we've been looking into this from every angle to try to get a sense of what commonalities there may be, what common points of exposure. Uh, what I will say, Patty, without revealing too much from a patient privacy perspective, is that um, in addition to seeing restaurants pop up as places that people have visited in the period in which they may have been infected with, with the virus, uh, we've also identified um, certain uh, apartment complexes where there seem to be cases. Those are the clusters that I mentioned. Again, I'm not going to reveal where those are for privacy reasons, but this could be a situation where folks are congregating by nature of where they live, but it could also be a situation that there is transmission happening within restaurants. I'm not sure which, if either, it is right now. It could also happen to be that these are popular places to go, so on and so forth, and there may not be transmission. So we're trying to get a better sense to disaggregate where people are versus where they may have been infected or exposed. Okay, thanks. Um, mm -hmm. And we've, we've heard from some school staff who work in Maine, but live in New Hampshire, and they say they can't get vaccinated under school staff eligibility in Maine because of where they live, and then um, they can't get vaccinated in New Hampshire because they work in Maine. Where do these folks fit in, and do you know how many are in that situation? Thanks, thanks, Patty. Uh, we too have been made aware of this, uh, th th this situation. Our position on who's eligible for vaccines hasn't changed, which is to say vaccines in Maine are allocated to us based on Maine's population, and thus those vaccines are for Maine residents. Uh, but at the same time, we've also communicated this to New Hampshire uh, to let them know that uh, there, there are different ways to think about this. So we're working on that precise issue right now. But as of right now, we're not changing the policy uh, as it relates to who is eligible for a vaccine. In terms of the number there, Patty, I, I don't have that at my fingertips, but let me see if I can find that for you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, let me turn over to Brian Sullivan next. Sure, I'll start with uh, the system update. What can you tell us? <laughs> okay, so Brian, uh, let's start with the community vaccination line. Because right now, <clears throat> that, that, that number, uh, which I would be remiss if I didn't repeat it one more time, 888-445-4111. Right now, that line functions as sort of an interface between those who need help accessing the existing registration websites, those that large hospitals may have. Um, that, that line is, 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 that vaccination line is sort of the intermediary. You can call and they will help get you an appointment if one is available. But in the near future, that line will also be helpful to scheduling appointments at the sites that opt to utilize the scheduling platform that we are bringing on. That scheduling platform, Brian, is through, it's going through the sandbox phase right now, and we're previewing it very soon with the sites that have expressed an interest in using it. 
I'm pleased to say that there are some large sites that have said scheduling remains a challenge for us. So we are very interested in using the state site. So we, we hope that that site, once it becomes live, will feature a number of different vaccination options. Some of them will be large scale, some might be medium or even smaller scale. But Brian, I just, I, I wanna, we've, we've mentioned this before, but I wanna mention it again. Uh, some of the large vaccinator groups in Maine, uh, the folks that have been doing this since December 14th, have very strong, robust registration platforms available. Our, our intention is not to supplant those. Uh, this is a situation where we are bringing this option online so that sites themselves that are coming online new vaccination venues can use this and not have to worry about simultaneously setting up a scheduling platform while they're handling all the other logistics. But sites that are comfortable with and have gotten good success from using their existing scheduling may opt to do so, and that's a-okay. Now, how long has this 188 number been uh, active? Well, we, we launched it sort of in a beta mode to make sure that all the uh, all the various questions that we knew were gonna be coming at us uh, had answers to them and all of the various logistical pieces were ready to go. Uh, we launched that in, in sort of the beta soft launch the middle of last week. Uh, we announced it more officially on Thursday, as you know, and I just wanted to boost that signal today. Okay, thank you. And I guess a question, the next one would be, I know that the, the vaccination uh, tracking system went down today, but um, can you give us any indication of what might be coming our way and more broadly, what uh, you'd like to see happen or would need to happen over the next month and a half in order to have the state where you'd like us to be um, when and avail uh, eligibility greatly increases? Sure. Um, and, and Brian, just as, as a note, um, the, 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 the sort of multi-state system that went down is just the system that tells us how many shots into arms. Doesn't affect our ordering or our distribution of vaccine. Uh, I don't have a sense of what yesterday looked like. Uh, as, as you can imagine, I'm, I'm waiting with bated breath to see how many shots in arms we did yesterday because that's a number that we're tracking. Uh, but we're also planning, as you noted, for the potential increase in the supply later this month or perhaps in early April. One of the things that our team has been doing is, is to work with existing vaccination sites. Almost uniformly, every single site has indicated to us that they can be doing more. They can be doing more vaccines per day, more hours in a day, more days per week, if only they had more shots to give. So we've been asking them, well, where can you go? If we remove the current constraint around supply, maybe not, maybe not entirely remove it, but relieve it greatly. How much more can you do? And to the extent that you have concerns about expanding right now, let's work on those today. If you need more navigators to help with traffic, if you need more registration people to help get people in the door and, and into a vaccination chair, let's work on that now rather than after we are start getting vaccines. Basically, what I, my message to vaccination sites across Maine is let's drill the well before we get thirsty. Thank you. Uh, let me turn it over to Megan at WMTW next. Thanks, Dr. Fa. My question is about the clinical trials um, for the Moderna vaccine for children. Um, I know between the United States and Canada, it's plus or minus like 6,500 kids who are taking part. I don't know if you are privy to this information or you get this information, but um, are there any children in Maine that are part of this clinical trial? And um, just your general thoughts on, uh, you know, when, you know, this, this process has been sort of sped up at least least, you know, for adults, do you think maybe children theoretically could be vaccinated before uh, going to school in the fall? Uh, that's an open question, Megan. Let me, let me first start with the main uh, element of that, which is uh, I'm not sure if there are uh, uh, individuals in Maine who, uh, those under 16, uh, who have been enrolled in the Moderna trial. Uh, they may be, they may not be. I don't have that information at my fingertips. Again, I can check with some of the folks on our vaccine team uh, to see if they happen to have heard. But more generally, the completion of these trials is expected to take several months, as did the trials that authorized or provided the basis for authorization for adults. The latest that I've been briefed on by the US CDC is that the results from the trials for either the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine may not be available until late summer. Uh, at the earliest, uh, and maybe even into early fall. 
So it's not clear whether the vaccines will by the FDA before we're talking seriously about going back into the classroom in the fall. Uh, now that there's a, one one last note there, Megan. Uh, you sort of you notion you mentioned the notion that this has been sped up, and in, in a sense it has. Insofar as uh, if you're going down a, a, a long street and uh, all of a sudden you, you are able to just hit all the green lights, yes, in that sense it's been sped up. But I just want to be really clear for everybody: no corners are being cut in the process. What's being happened? It, what's happening is that because of the urgency of getting vaccines authorized, uh, the federal government and various partners are just mandatorily turning on everything to be a green light. But the road is the same, the destination is the same. No corners are being cut. We're just getting there more quickly because we're coordinating rather than doing everything in sequence. We're doing it in parallel. Uh, let me turn to Joe Lawler next. Um, yes, hi. Uh, thanks for taking our questions today. Uh, do you have any uh, insight into uh, projections into what the vaccine supply will be uh, for next week? Are we looking at another modest increase? Have you heard? I, I've, only, I've only heard um, in the qualitative or in the abstract, Joe, I haven't seen the hard numbers yet. Um, so, but w what I've been briefed on uh, by federal officials is that next week's vaccine supply is thought to look uh, very similar to this week's supply, which is to say there may be, uh, there may not even be any increases in, 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 uh, in, in what, what is being sent to states at all, or if there are increases, uh, they may be very modest at best. Okay. Um but uh, presuming that um, the projections are correct in terms of by late March or early April, we're going to start seeing some really big increases in supply. Um, are there any discussions? I know Connecticut has uh, moved up the, the ages by a few weeks to stagger it out a little bit more so you don't have a huge influx of people um, who become eligible all at once on May 1st. Is there any talk about that? Um, you know, I've, I've, I've chatted with counterparts of mine, including in Connecticut, as well as some other states that have, have moved those earlier. You know, what, what they were seeing, Joe, was that they were having a high number of spots go unfilled in many of their clinics. Indeed, in one state, uh, they were even at the point where they were taking clinics offline or talking about taking clinics offline because of so many slots that were being unfilled. Uh, we're not seeing that here. I, I've even, I, I've asked the operators of the large and medium and even small throughput sites in Maine to tell me if or when they start seeing slots that are going unfilled, because that would be a, a signal to us to start thinking about that, th those changes you made. But we haven't seen that yet. But I want to be clear, you know, it's, it's only the 16th. And this changes really, really quickly. So I'm not, I'm not saying, Joe, that it's a no. I'm saying we're not seeing it yet. Okay, and one final uh, question. I know you talked a lot about Piscataquis County. Um, there's also been a pretty significant increase in, in Kennebec County. Are, are there any um, thoughts as to why that's happening there? No, you know, Joe, you, you're, you're right. Um, so, you know, the reason Piscataquis County draws our attention is one, it has been, relatively speaking, uh, not, not, not an area of significant transmission. And so the fact that it is now and has been Sort of jumping on, uh, jumping on the radar just in the past couple of weeks, that was one thing that that draw uh, draw drew our attention to it. Uh, the second is that there isn't a defined outbreak in Piscataquis County. This is uh, seems to be a function of community transmission, uh, and so that's that's a distinction. Kennebec County too has started to see increases. Um, some of it is a little bit more tethered to some outbreaks that are happening, uh, and, and so on and so forth. It also hasn't been that over 100% increase just as compared to last month as we are seeing in Piscataquis. So it is concerning. I don't have any more granular information about Kennebec. Again, we can try to get some more of that for you, but it didn't register as, as uniquely as did the situation in, in Piscataquis County. Uh, let me turn it over to Mel Meyer next. Okay. Um, it's now been three full months since the vaccine rollout um, started, and there are ongoing disparities when looking at the entire population and looking at the data for the general population that may 
meet age eligibility requirements. Places like Somerset County are falling behind. Is this a matter of access, not enough vaccines, or something else? Yeah, that's a, a good question, Mal. We've we've discussed that at length internally. Uh, let's talk about the, the the possible diagnoses, and then talk about what we're doing about it. Um, and we we've as as you as you know, there could be a couple of different things going on simultaneously. Uh, one is, are there sufficient access points? Are there enough channels? through which vaccine can be delivered and administered there. We've, um, and, and then the other is, uh, do, we need to, do we need to do more about making those access points real and viable? Do the hours work for people? Do they know how to actually you know, access the access points, things of that nature? And then are there concerns that are in the community that are floating around about uh, questions they have about the vaccine that we can try to help answer? So those are the three possible things that might be going on. What we're doing about it is, well, in, in keeping with all three of those, let's talk about the first one. Are there enough channels, enough access points? Well, we need to do more there. Uh, and, and we have started over the past two weeks to activate more and more channels within, uh, within Somerset County, as well as in Oxford County. So for example, as we've been working with retail pharmacy partners, be it Hannaford's, Walmart, or Walgreens, when we work with those partners, they often come to us, come back to us and say, hey, look, we have a lot of stores in Maine. We have a lot of outlets. Where do you want to start? And with respect to Walgreens and Hannaford's most recently, uh, we have gone to them and said, these are the counties that we are particularly concerned about. Somerset, Oxford, Washington, to a lesser extent. Uh, and we've preferentially activated points of access in those counties. The second thing is we've got to make sure those are real. So you'll see in our weekly allocations of vaccines that we've taken steps to make sure that counties of concern are getting as much vaccine as we can push to them. I know it's not enough, let me be clear, but you'll see, for example, that Piscataquis, Somerset, Oxford, to say, the lead, to, to say nothing of the others, are, we're trying to make sure that the existing access points are getting as much vaccine as we can. Is it enough? No. But as supply increases, we'll be able to true that up. And then the third is, are, are there concerns in the community that we can address? So we've chatted with our district liaisons who are in those counties to try to get a sense of what might be holding people back. And if there are questions we can answer, we'll do so. Is, is part of the problem looking at the retailers, um, Walgreens, Walmart, those places that have been now directed to prioritize teachers? Uh, I'm thinking specifically of Somerset County. They only have uh, two healthcare providers that are doing the vaccine clinics. They have a number of other retailers, but if those are prioritizing teachers, is that then impacting uh, vaccination efforts in some of these areas? I, I don't. I don't think so in significant ways, Mal. Um, you know this this concern around those counties not administering or having administered a sufficient vaccine to those 70 and over previously, 60 and over now. That concern predated. The, uh, the educator child care worker piece. And it hasn't really changed in numerical relative terms since that went online. I'm not ruling that out, but it's not my primary diagnosis. And then I guess, sorry, my, my last question, uh, you know, we've, we have talked and you have talked to a great lengths about the Johnson and Johnson and how that might open up possibilities for things like drive-through clinics. Might that be then an area where you would prioritize setting up some of those clinics in places like Somerset County, is that an option? It absolutely is. There is we, we've been actually undertaking specific planning with, for example, EMS agencies in Somerset, Oxford. Uh, again, those are the two areas of the two counties uh, of, of highest um, uh, of geographic disparity. And so we've had conversations with EMS agencies, as well as other providers, be they federally qualified health centers and even hospitals, to see, okay, when we get more J&J &J vaccine, could we do a pop-up clinic, for example? All of that is contingent upon us getting more J&J &J vaccine. And right now, for at least the next week or week and a half, that doesn't look like it's in the cards. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, let me turn it over to Amy Brown next. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. What is the process for the FDA to move from emergency use authorization to full authorization for the vaccines and how long will that take? Sure, Amy, so the, the, uh, the other avenue 
for a vaccine is to get to go through what's called the BLA process, the Biologics Licensing Application Process, uh, and that is that is a process that looks at the same things: is the vaccine safe? Is it effective? Does does the manufacturing adhere to traditional good manufacturing practices? That process uh, is, however, not one that the companies have themselves submitted for. Uh, and so the first step is for the companies to apply officially for that BLA. That starts the various gears in motion to get the, that, that process going, to review the more updated data, so on and so forth. I don't know when the companies in their negotiations or their discussions with FDA will opt to make that application. Uh, that's of course something that we at the state level don't really get involved with. Uh, that's really between the manufacturers and the US FDA. But in big picture terms, that's the beginning of the process. From there, there are the subsequent scientific reviews. But again, sort of in, in keeping with the same note I made to Megan's question, that is not to suggest even for an, a split second that the process that we've undertaken thus far through the authorization is and has in any way cut any corners. The other process, the full authorization process, involves the same steps, the same scientific scrutiny, the same analysis of safety that the BLA process would. In this case, however, the EUA process was followed, and the way it was followed was essentially to turn on all the green lights, not cutting any corners. So why would they not just go ahead and move forward with that with so many people who are concerned because of the fact that the vaccines only have emergency use authorization? It's a fair question, Amy. I, that's one I would direct you to the FDA or the companies on. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any updates on variants in the state, in particular uh, in Piscataquis County, where you're seeing so many new cases? Um, I will. We'll get the latest numbers on the variants in Piscataquis County. We should probably be getting the latest data on the last round of sequencing over the next day or two. Uh, usually we get that on a Thursday or so, maybe on a Friday morning. Uh, and so once we've got that, we'll, we'll, up, we'll update everybody, but no updates at this time. Okay, finally, just one last quick question. Is it known what caused the outage at the vaccine tracking site? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, let me turn it over to Chris Costa next. Hi, Dr. Shaw. You can imagine it's a night, nightmare of a day for me when there's no data to report. Um, <laughs> do you know I was wondering what you were going to put on Twitter today. I know. It's, uh, it's going to have to be pictures of my baby <laughs> or my dog. Um, just a, a quick clarifier on that. When the system does come back online, will the data for March 15th be separated out in a way that we can all kind of understand what was reported on the 15th, the 16th, et cetera? Yeah. Um, Chris, it may not be on the dashboard per se, but we will make it available. Maybe we'll put a note on the website uh, right above or below the dashboard. I'll try to put it on social media and such. It may not be on the dashboard itself because once it gets resolved, the dashboard will just pull all the data and update itself automatically. But we will make sure that those data from yesterday, March 15th, are specifically available. My hope is that it goes back online today. So what it get, when it gets updated, it gets updated with yesterday's data. But if not, Chris, we'll make sure we separate that out. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, so there was a question that came from one of our viewers that I thought might be interesting to ask you. Um, she's asking, are businesses allowed to ask or possibly even require that patrons be vaccinated? One, I don't know if this is a possibility, so I wanted to ask you. And then also, uh, this viewer wanted to know, is there any health benefit to uh, establishments or patrons doing this type of process? Sure. So let me let me first let me start with the former question and the answer to whether businesses are allowed to ask or and I assume that the follow on is require uh, that their patrons be vaccinated. I don't know the answer. And I say that in not in the um, I, I say that in the I don't know if anyone knows the answer. Uh, I, that's a question that has certainly been discussed at the national level. I've seen it discussed in uh, various different media outlets, but I don't know if there is an answer to the extent to which a business can do that, uh, whether it's about Maine law or federal law. Uh, I, I've seen some commentators suggest that it's feasible uh, and, and allowable. I've seen others who have raised questions about it from an Amer you know, from a various uh, disability rights standpoints. 
I'm not sure what the answer, Chris, is. And I, again, I mean that in, I'm not sure if there is an answer right at this time. Now, is it advisable? Um, again, the advisability question, hard to say. But what I think is really important about that, Chris, is that irrespective of whether businesses ultimately do or do not ask for or do more around vaccines, the, the baseline principles around wearing a mask when you're potentially coming into contact with others, maintaining six feet of physical distancing, those are going to apply uh, irrespective of whether you've been vaccinated. So I think that's really the, the take home point, which is we're not out of this yet. And things like masking and distancing are still going to be critical features. That the, that the CDC will, will keep the, the guidance on, right? Even though we will continue with our vaccine process, is that what you're saying? That's right, that's exactly right. Okay, gotcha. Um, and then the second question I had for you had to do with school districts. Um, sounds like a lot of uh, parents, and I'm sure in some cases, districts and teachers, and, and I'm, sorry, I'm sure students as well, are interested in getting back to in-person learning five days a week. I know that in some districts it's happening in some ways and so on and so forth. What guidance is the main CDC giving to school districts? And I know that there's a, this big issue of three foot versus six foot spacing. Is the CDC advising on that issue in particular? about how to get back to that five days a week of in-person learning? Yep. So, you know, Chris, um, I'm, I think this is a, you know, um, let's, let's rewind just a bit to August of last year, where when we started surveying what was needed, we saw two things. The first was concerns expressed by educators over what might be the educational implications of kids not being back in school in person. The other thing we found was a complete absence of federal guidance on the best way to get kids back in to the classroom, which has been our goal ever since we started back down uh, classroom education last fall. So we took it upon ourselves to construct a, a series of, of guidance documents that really focused on six principles, six public health approaches to get kids back in the classroom. Things like masking, uh, things like hand hygiene, things like testing, symptom checking, and as you noted, physical distancing. Now, at the time, there was a diversity of opinion about what the optimum distance was. The US CDC eventually recommended six feet, but the American Academy of Pediatrics did a deep dive into the literature and found that three feet was something that was acceptable. We ourselves looked at that same literature, and I myself came to that same conclusion, that three feet of distance was acceptable. Uh, sub, sub, and that, that three foot was one of the reasons that Maine has been able to get kids in classrooms. Again, we talk a lot about reopening schools as a country. But it's important to note that schools in Maine have been open. What we're talking about in Maine is not opening schools. We're talking about getting even more kids back into the classroom. So all of that takes us to today, where subsequent to then, since August, there have now been more studies, one of which just came out last weekend about the safety of three feet of distance, uh, essentially demonstrating that the judgment call that we made back when uh, was, was the right call and it's helped keep more kids in the classroom. That guidance hasn't changed. Uh, we still recommend masking, distancing, hand washing, symptom checking, and that three feet of distance. Uh, just last night on a call with some of my colleagues from the US CDC, they acknowledged that they are re-examining their six foot approach in light of the relative safety and experience in states like Maine to see if they're gonna change it. So we haven't changed our approach and we think that approach is one that is appropriately balanced safety, seeing very little transmission, as well as getting kids and keeping them in the classroom. Awesome, thank you, Dr. Shaw. Hey, Chris. Uh, going over to Stephen Porter at Seacoast next. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. I also have a question about schools. I understand that high schools are trying to figure out how to safely hold graduation this year. It sounds like those in our area here in York County are taking a variety of approaches. Some look like uh, 2020, others more like 2019. So uh, with where we stand on the vaccination rollout combined with the seasonal factors, do you think it will be safe in late May or early June to return to a more normal commencement ceremony? You know, uh, Stephen, I, I don't, the answer is I'm not sure. That's the bottom line answer. Here's, here's the two ways that I look at it. On one hand, we are making progress in vaccinations, which keeps all of us safe. The more folks we vaccinate in our communities, the safer everyone else is. Um, and that's, that's positive. Uh, it's also uh, probable, possible, that many of these graduation events will be held outside, which greatly reduces the likelihood of any kind of transmission. On the other side though, 
we are seeing variants take hold in a number of states, Florida, to say nothing of some others. We're also starting to see some signs on the horizon suggesting that case numbers might be taking making a U-turn. We're not there yet, but it's a concern that's out there, as I mentioned a moment ago. So all of that is to say, Stephen, I don't know what mid-May will look like and thus what the advisability or the relative safety of graduation events like that might be. That is for many um, high school seniors, college seniors, um, that may just seem like a gut punch, right? I mean, the last year has been hard enough if you're a senior and maybe the only thing that was keeping you going was a blowout graduation ceremony. So I, I say that with, um, you know, with a recognition of, 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 of what those events mean and how important they are as milestones. But I'm gonna be honest with everyone, I'm not sure what they'll look like. Uh, if we stay on a trajectory where we keep vaccinating at the high pace that we are, and we can outrun these variants and outrun new cases, it's optimistic, but can't take that to the bank yet. So uh, a perhaps related question, you, you and the Mills administration have been clear that being eligible for a vaccine isn't the same as having access to the vaccine. Obviously, if a vaccinator doesn't have a shot, they can't give it to you. Uh, with this accelerated eligibility timeline uh, that was announced on Friday, do you have a sense yet for how many eligible Mainers will actually have access to a vaccine right away? I guess, put another way, will someone in my shoes as a 30-something who's not a healthcare worker, not a teacher, will I still be waiting until July? Will people like me still be waiting until July? Um, it's, uh, it's possible. Uh, we're, we're hoping not, though. So let me, let me frame it this way. Um, come May 1st, when per President Biden's directive, uh, all those who are 18 and over, 16 and over for one of the vaccines will be eligible. In Maine, uh, that will mean several hundred thousand people who will be eligible, not just those who were 40 and above, whom we were planning on vaccinating anyways, but also those in their 30s and in their 20s. Um, so it is, it is several hundred thousand people, but the president, I think, was clear, or at least careful, to make the same point that Governor Mills and I and Commissioner Lambrou have made, which is uh, just because you're in the eligibility tier doesn't mean the vaccine is there. And I think this, the president maybe was even implicitly signaling the change from May 1st with eligibility, but 4th of July as when we really start getting into the swing of, of, of larger scale vaccinations. I think he was implicitly acknowledging that there's two weeks, or sorry, two months, two months in a week, uh, where all of that will be happening. So what we're doing on our end, Stephen, is to try to build out that capacity as much as possible now, as I mentioned in connection with an earlier question. I can't promise you or, or any money, anybody in your shoes about when between May and whenever uh, you're, you're, you'll be able to get a vaccine. I'm hoping it's really quickly. I'm hoping, of course, it's as soon as possible. We're taking steps to build out as much headroom in the vaccination process so that when we get vaccines, we can fill up to capacity every single day. But I, I can't make you a promise that that's gonna be June 8th or May 24th or July 3rd. I'm hoping it's as soon as possible. Though. And I'm working 24 seven to make it as fast as possible. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, over to Patrick Whittle at the AP next. Uh, thank you very much. I wanted to just make sure I have my mind around something here. So the, the seven-day rolling average of, of new cases in the state is, has ticked up somewhat over the last couple of weeks. Um, I, I believe we're still below the post-holiday spike. And is it, is it safe to say that the main driver of the uptick is the increase in Piscataquis County? Or can, can we not say that? Um, Patrick, that's a part of it. But if you, um, you, know, if, if you take a look... Um, at the numbers here, um, you know, just in the past 16 days or so, including today, it's been 76 cases there for the comparable period before uh, in February it was 36. So it's 40 more cases over a 16 day period. So it's about three or so, two to, two to three cases more per day over the past 16 days than the comparable period. Uh, that is part of why the moving average is a little bit higher now than it was say 12 to 16 days ago, but it's not all of it. There's also overall transmission happening 
across the state. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a bit of both. Okay, good. Um, also, many people in the state, possibly including me, are very excited that Funtown Splashtown is going to be reopening this year. Uh, I want to make sure I, I understand how the outdoor gathering rules apply to businesses like this, because the, the uh, Economic and, and Community Development Department does have rules about, um, about, about amusement parks specifically, but then there are other rules that are about outdoor gatherings and businesses specifically. So are they allowed to operate at 100% capacity when we get to May? Um, so as of right now, well, so let, let me, let me re rewind. Um, Patrick, as, you, as your question noted, you know, as, as we go through the summer and as we, we hope to see continued trends being favorable, we're working to expand uh, the, the, the gathering limits, particularly on the outdoor side. Referenced a moment ago, the relative safety of outdoor gatherings has been uh, a, a, a good and consistent finding throughout the pandemic. As it relates to, to Funtown Splashtown in particular or similar uh, amusement park type gatherings, they're gonna be governed by the more specific amusement park checklists rather than the more general ones. So yes, as it relates to May, they would be able to be at the 100% capacity given the outdoor gatherings. But I just wanna put in a note, you know, there are so many nuances there. So specific questions should really be focused to DECD. They, they really have the, the final answers on that. Okay, terrific, I'll do that. Thank you very much. You bet, Patrick. And the final question for the afternoon goes to Caitlin Andrews. Oh, hello, Dr. Shaw. Thank you for being patient. Um, I So a couple of questions. Um, I was just looking at a press release from the Department of Corrections, and they mentioned something about possibly starting testing for residents or vaccinations for residents in the Department of Corrections. Can you give me a little bit more insight into that? Sure. Um, so we are working with the Department of Corrections to, uh, to vaccinate those age eligible residents of the DOC facilities. So those 60 and over. Uh, we're working on that uh, with, uh, with the Department of Corrections. It's a, a logistical, there's a lot of logistics going on given the different facilities and everything, but that's something that we've been thinking through, analyzing, getting the data on, and now we're moving out with it, uh, hopefully soon. Okay, can you give me a sense of, um, I know obviously like the question around like when prisoners are gonna be vaccinated has been an ongoing question. Um, what is it about now that makes this um, possible to vaccinate them? And can you talk to me about some of those logistical challenges that you think you'll face? Sure, so it, one, of the, one of the things about, it, it's not so much, I guess it is now because we've been trying to plan and make sure we had all the pieces in place. So let me, I'll give you a, a quick sampling of some of the logistics challenges. Um, the first is, and it really comes down to which vaccine. So for example, um, one of the things that I wanted to make sure we understood before we started vaccinating a group uh, of, of, um, of DOC uh, inmates is uh, how, how many of them will still be in that facility 28 days later? Because if, we, if some of them are scheduled to be released, then we either need to make sure they are connected with someone to get their second dose when that time has come, or alternatively, we need to switch to vaccines. And compiling that data, we wanted to make sure we got it right. So we now have a better sense of that which allows us to pick the vaccine that we can use and so on and so forth. Uh, some of it as well, uh, Caitlin, is contingent upon vaccine supply. So we now have a little bit more vaccine. We did not think last week or this next week that we were going to get any J&J &J vaccine at all. You'll recall two weeks ago, uh, the word that I had received was that there would be no J&J &J vaccine forthcoming. As it turns out, we ended up getting 1,600 doses this week and we'll hopefully receive the same for next week. So we've got that supply that we weren't expecting, which also facilitates us moving toward vaccines. Now, uh, with vaccinating this group, the age eligible group of DOC inmates. Uh, you know, we're, 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 so that's, that's kind of where we are right now. Okay, a um, couple more, more, I guess, like follow-ups on that. Um, so is it, it sounds like you're thinking that they might be vaccinated with the J&J &J vaccines, or is it gonna be the... Um... It, it, it is likely to be the J&J &J vaccine because again, we, when, we, when we queried those who are eligible, we saw that a number of them have a release date. So again, we don't wanna get into a situation where we're only partially vaccinating. Dr. Fauci has expressed concerns over 
partial vaccination. Uh, and so it is, I, I don't want to say right now, Caitlin, I want to look at all the data, but it will either be the J&J &J or the Moderna vaccine or a mixture okay. of both. Do you, do you see the, um, them being part of the state, you know, as the state's like age-based plan progresses, do you see them being vaccinated kind of as part of that? Or is this just like, we're going to do this older group first and then kind of see where we are? No, the, you know, the, uh, the, the, we've, we've, the view has always been, they are part of the age-based tiers. Indeed, one of the, you know, one of the reasons we moved to age-based tiers is that it provides that uniformity. So as we proceed through those tiers, uh, I, I would envision that we'll continue this. Okay, and then one completely different question. Um, the state is um, about six weeks away from having all of its adults be eligible for vaccinations. We've touched on this a little bit throughout the briefing, but how do you see the vaccination ever being different by then? You know, do you think like drive-through clinics, like walk-ins, um, things like that might be more common or um, even rolling out at that point? Yeah, sure. Let me, one note on the first point, Caitlin, on drive throughs We are already doing drive through clinics. Um, just last Friday, uh, the Buxton Fire Department and EMS did a drive through The previous Wednesday, uh, Old Orchard Beach has done one. So we're already doing the drive throughs uh, But here's what I think will be changing in general, uh, which is, is two things. The first is more channels of vaccine being made available. Right now, for the most part, Vaccine is available through certain channels, retail pharmacies, the large scale community vaccination sites, sites that are run by hospitals, federally qualified health centers. But as we get more vaccine, we're looking to activate more channels of vaccination. Uh, maybe it's independent medical practices, other chain pharmacies, independent pharmacies, so on and so forth. So making vaccine available in more venues across the state. Uh, the second thing that I think will be different is just the, the ease of finding a slot. Uh, as there's more and more vaccine, what I've asked vaccine sites to do is to think about three things. Number one, can you do more shots per day by adding more vaccinators per site? Number two, can you do more hours per day? And number three, can you do more days per week? And different sites have different constraints, so each site is taking a slightly different approach to maximizing throughput. And that's gonna continue. It's gonna be that dial we keep turning up. But as we continue to do so, then shots will be easier to find. The third thing, and this is sort of in connection with Mal's question, uh, geographic access. Geographic access continues to be a challenge. So we're not slowing down or stopping, adding more points of access. I talked about the channels of access, and then we're also looking to add more points of access as well, more sites in which people in different parts of the state can actually get vaccine. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, hey everyone, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Uh, thanks again to our colleagues in the media for the questions and helping keep everyone up to date on where we stand. Uh, we'll have more to talk about later this week on vaccines. I hope that includes some numbers as well. Once we get that live and up to date, we'll get the latest numbers on vaccination rates out to everybody. But in the meantime, I thank you for taking some time out of your day to tune in, hear where we are, and get the latest updates on COVID-19. I look forward to chatting with everyone again on Thursday. But in the meantime, as always, be kind, take care of one another. We'll see everyone soon.